In this video, we're going to briefly review the string method and operations. So let's start by creating a new notebook and let's call it string method for short. So let's also um, take the same example we saw in the previous video, which is simply a string with the Latin sentence lorem ipsum, or lor fit amid. You know it from many example texts on the web and so on. So in a previous video, we ended with the notion that the string data type is a so-called immutable data type. That means after the object, a string object, is created in memory, the ones and zeros inside the object cannot be changed anymore. We contrast this with, for example, the list data type, which is a mutable data type, an example of a mutable data type. And in the video, who am I and how many, we saw that when we use a list object, we can actually replace individual elements inside the list after the list has been created. And we cannot do that with the string data type. So let's uh, go ahead and uh, look at an example. So first, um, before we um, have another coding example, let's briefly go ahead and um, draw a memory diagram of what happened when we execute the code that I just showed you in the JupyterLab environment. So what's going to happen is we first get a box here in memory, the object. It is of type string, str, and it basically models somehow the text lorem ipsum. So let's put that in here. And then after the object is created, we assign the name text in the global scope to this object. So what does it mean for this object here to be immutable? Well, it means nothing that is or anything that is in here can never be changed anymore. So let's change it or let's presumably change it. So let's go ahead and use a string method that we have seen a couple of times before. For example, the lower method. So I'm going to invoke the lower method on the text object here. And uh, we get back text that is lowercase, okay? The entire sentence now is lowercase. So basically the only thing that changes is the, the starting L, which, is, which goes from uppercase to lowercase. So if we go ahead, and um, we go ahead and simply look at what text is after we invoked the, lo the lower method, we see that text is still uppercase here. So in other words, text itself has not been changed. This is how we see that in code and the output uh, in JupyterLab. But let's see what's going to happen in the environment in the memory. So when we call the, in, in this case, the lower method that is attached to any object of type string, what is going to happen is we get back another object, of course, also of type string. And here, lorem ipsum will be written with a lowercase l. And now we are basically getting a reference to this object back. And in our example, let's look at the code here, in uh, the, thir the third cell here, what I'm going to do with the return value of the method, I'm not doing anything with it, right? We are not saving it away. But let's assume we are going to um, save that in a variable, let's call it lower simply. Now, if we go ahead and look at the lower variable, it is basically the object that was created in the step before. And let's assume this is what we did um, here in the memory diagram. Well, what this is going to do is it will create a new variable in the um, global scope called lower. And this is now going to reference uh, this object here, okay? But the important idea is that we now have two objects, very similar indeed, but two objects. So let's um, take this one um, step further. So let's go ahead and take the lowercase object and uh, let's go ahead and lowercase it one more time. So on the lower object, which is a string object, I'm going to invoke the lower method, which also gives me something back. Now, in the extreme case, in this case here, in the edge case, so to say where the word is or the sentence is already all lowercase, what is going to happen in memory is the following. We get back another object, also of type string for sure, also within it lorem, lowercase. We get back a reference to this object and this time we are not going to store it away. So that means since we don't uh, store away a reference to it, well, at some point in the future, the garbage collector will come uh, along and will simply remove this object from uh, the memory again. So for those of you who watched this video and may have some previous knowledge in Python, maybe some expert knowledge as well, 
you may wonder that does this really happen and the answer is no so in this case because we're not changing it we get back the same object however the best way to think of how these objects work in general is to assume that whenever we invoke a method we get back a new object with in this case has the same the exact same ones and zeros inside them as the, the previous one okay that is basically the mental model i want to give you with so that if you use this way of reasoning about code you will always get the result in your program that you expect okay so the memory diagrams is always a, a little bit of a simplification of what is going on really in the memory but this is the um, mental model that i want you to get okay so that is um what um, is um, yeah that is usually what we see uh, when we call methods on immutable um, objects so what do we what do i mean by that well whenever we call a method on an immutable object and the string data type is only one example of that then usually the method is going to return to us some other object and we will see in a future video when we talk about the list data type in detail a mutable data type then we will see that methods that change an object in place they don't have a return value that is a big conceptual difference okay so we note down um, that a method called on an uh, immutable data type usually has a return value and this could be an uh, another object with the same ones and zeros the same semantic value okay so that is uh, an important idea here so let's go ahead and uh, look at a couple of other methods so for example um, text objects so string objects have a method on them that is called find and find can be um, used to find in this case um, either an individual character or maybe a so-called substring inside the, the text object so let's go ahead and try to find um, let's say the letter o and if um, we look um, at the uh, at this version of the text above so the uppercase version the title case version then what we see is the first occurrence of the lowercase o is the second um, character in in the word or in the sentence here so we get back the index one because by now we know that a python is zero based so the index one means second position here so now let's go ahead and see what is going to happen when we look for um, some character that is not even uh, in the string so let's look for uppercase x for example and here we get back negative one so the negative one is what a programmer would refer to as a so-called sentinel value so it's a value that in the context of the find method does not have a real semantic meaning so um, what does it really mean to be uh, at index negative one here um, so the negative one is just a, a dummy value a so-called sentinel value that indicates that the character here um, is not in the um, in the string now you may wonder negative one as we saw in in the previous video could be the index negative one which would be the first character because we're talking about strings coming from the right hand side right so it would be the dot so let's uh, compare that just a re little review if i take the text object and i index into that with negative one i get back a period i personally don't like that we get back negative one here so this is um, what I would uh, actually prefer, that is my taste um, of a programming language, is that I would get an error message here, right? So one of the red error messages. Why would I personally prefer that? Well, if I get back a negative one, um, an, an object, so in this case negative one, that could be somehow interpreted in this case as an index, then this could be a source of semantic errors in your programs. Because you're looking for some character, and the, the computer uh, program does not find it, it gives you back negative one, and maybe you are going to use whatever result you get from the find method in the next line of code to index into something, and then it's still gonna work because negative one is unfortunately a valid index. So I would personally prefer to get a so-called loud error message. So a loud error just means um, the program just complains to you and it stops basically, and we could, we have seen in another previous video, um, how to handle such errors right using the try uh, statement uh, the try accept statement we can always use to catch errors and do something only if uh, the error occurs um, however here we get back um, what i sometimes in my notes refer to as a silent error so it's not really an error here it's just python's way of saying we didn't find something here but um, you have to simply have to be careful right because negative one could be interpreted it, it, it also works as an index that is the big problem here Okay, and also just a, a little side note: the, the find method also accepts um, 
an argument that is longer than the actual um, character or one character. So for example, I could look for the term ipsum and I get back index six, which means at the seventh character starts the word ipsum in all lowercase. And here also maybe a variant, um, let's say if you want to look for the first O that comes after the first O here. So let's say you want to look for the second O in this text object, what you could do is you could uh, provide the find method a second argument which is the start value. So let's provide the start value one. We also get back one, because if we start to look at index one, then we will find the same O. However, if we um, start with um, at the position one plus one in this case, so two really, the index two, then we get back 13, because the next O, which is the, the first O in the word Dolor, um, is at the index 13, okay? And then uh, also um, we could have a third argument, which is the upper limit excluded um, in the range in which we want to search. So if you want to search, let's say some character, but you only want to search in the first half of a sentence, then you could simply set the second uh, or the third argument here to basically half of the length of the text object. Okay, so um, you have to be a bit careful here, but you can use the find method in all various ways. You probably are going to need it for one of the exercises. So um, just get used to that, but um, that is the find method. Another method, um, let's mention that briefly, is a so-called count method. So let's say if instead of finding the first O, I want to count how many O's are in the text object here, um, I can simply use the count method. Okay, so a couple of um, other methods um, that I don't want to show here because we have seen them in previous videos are of course all the uh, methods that regard uh, the lower and upper casing. So there's a dot lower method as we saw above, there's a dot upper uh, method as well, there's a dot title uh, method. Um, another methods, uh, string method that we have seen previously is for example the split method, uh, the, the strip method, uh, sorry. The strip method uh, strips away leading and um, ending white space. And then uh, comes a method that we have not seen in this course, which is the split method. So if I say text.split, what I get back is a list of the individual words in the sentence. So how does the split method work? The split method by default, so if I don't give it an argument, so by default, it simply goes ahead, it takes whatever um, text it is invoked on, and it simply um, splits the, the text um, into, um, into many other string objects separated by white space. So whenever in the actual sentence here, let's say text, there is white space in between something, the white space is used as the, the default delimiter. And now we get back um, as we see um, a list of string objects. However, you could also go ahead and uh, give the split method an argument. So let's go ahead and let's split at all the O's, for example. And then I get back a list where um, all the remains um, um, outside the O um, are there. And of course, so for, um, for example, the white space is now part of the word here because white space is not, um, a, div it's not a delimiter here. So we um, basically are doing something that in this case would probably not be very meaningful, but sometimes you want to split a long string, um, not by, uh, by white space. So another uh, very popular example probably is assuming you have watched the previous video or the video two videos ago, um, where we saw that we can create a multi-line uh, string or um, where we also saw how to load in, um, you know, uh, the entire contents from a text file from disk, you could basically split in a, a big string um, at the new line characters. And then you get back a list of all the lines. This is also sometimes very useful. And also something that um, may be useful is the following. It's the opposite of split, it's the so-called join method. So let's go ahead and create a list first. And let's put in the list um, a couple of words like this will be a sentence. Let's do it like this. And it's also, maybe let's leave it that other way. So this is just a list of strings, okay? And let's say I want to join these words together. What I could do is, and now um, comes into play that uh, what I showed you when we started the, the discussion on strings, I showed you that it's uh, sometimes uh, very valuable to simply use a so-called empty string. So um, starting and ending double quotes. And on the empty string, which is a 
this is a literal which evaluates into a string object, you can of course call methods as well. So let's call the dot join method on it. And the join method takes as an argument an iterable and a list object is an iterable. So we can loop over it. And then what it's going to do is the join method is going to join together um, the words from the list from the iterable. And as the delimiter, it's going to use whatever we give it here. Okay, so in this case, the empty string, so nothing basically. So this would be this would be basically joined together into one string without any spaces. And now if you go ahead and instead of the empty string, I give it a string with one space in it, I get back um, one string object. So previously I have one, two, three, four, five string objects in the list, but now I get back one string object that is important um, that has that consists of all the words joined together. Okay, so this is often uh, something that you see um, when um, yeah you want to um, before you want to print something out. Let's say you are given some parts and you want to join them together before printing out. You often see that in real life code. So let's continue and let's assign that to a variable. Let's say sentence, and let's simply also um, look at what sentence is. And let's say I want to replace something in a string. What you could do is you could use another string method the so-called replace method. So let's invoke the replace method on the sentence object here. And let's replace the word um, will be, so these two words, let's replace this series with simply the word is. Now what I get back is the word this is a sentence, okay? However, one thing that I just want to remind you of, if we look at the actual sentence, uh, we still have will be in it. Okay, and the reason why is, as we learned at the beginning of this video, the string data type is an immutable data type. Therefore, methods that uh, give back some version, some probably um, um, yeah, um, other string, a string that is derived from the, the string on which we invoke the method, then we always get back a new string object and we never get back the same object as we invoke the method on with a different value in it, okay? So that's uh, kind of important here. Um, this is also what you see here. Okay, the, the methods above, uh, some of them returned indices na quite naturally, but here we have another example um, of um, a method returning another string that is basically a version of the actual string we started with. And because um, the string method or the string data type is immutable, we get back a new string object. Okay, that is the replace method. And uh, in the notes, you will find a couple of more methods that are not so uh, popular. So I will leave it up to you to read it, but these are the most important methods uh, on a string. And now let's look at something uh, very much related to methods, but still different. Let's look at um, operations, so string operations. So whenever I use the term method, then what I always mean is we simply call a method that is attached to a data type, just like that using the dot operator. But when I talk about operations, what I usually mean is we do something with a string and some operator. That is why we call it an operation. So let's say I take my sentence and note how we forgot intentionally the period at the end of the sentence. And let's say I want to add um, the uh, a period at the end. What I could do is I could say simply plus and let's add another string to it with a dot, the period. And now I get back a new string, which uh, basically gives me back a string with a dot in it. Okay, so here we're starting with one string that we already had in memory. We create a second string on the fly that only has a dot in it. And the two together, they are added together and they give me a third string in the memory, which is uh, basically uh, the combination of the two. And this is also um, a concept that we have seen before. So this is also what we call concatenation. So before we called it list concatenation because we saw it in the context of list objects. Now we call it string concatenation, but concatenation really means simply take two things, concatenate them together, quite easy. And of course, what we saw with list uh, concatenation was that we could also multiply something, multiply a, a list object. Now we can also multiply with integer numbers, any string object. So let's maybe go ahead and um, multiply uh, the string high like this, we get back five highs. And then I could also go ahead and say add and say students. And this is going to say hi, 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 and so on students. So the operations work here um, just as well, just like in the context of lists basically. Let's look at a 
for to end this video, let's look at a, a special kind of operator. So let's look at the um, relational um, operators that uh, compare a left and a right hand um, operand. So let's maybe make a new section here and let's call it comparison. So let's um, simply go ahead and make an example so that we um, understand that. So let's try to um, compare apples and bananas. Usually this is not a good um, comparison. So let's go ahead and say apple and let's compare it and by saying is lower than banana. And uh, indeed I get a true. And the reason why is because the letter A comes before the letter B in the alphabet. Okay, so that is why apple is smaller. However, if we go ahead and we lowercase apple and we compare it with uppercase or title case banana, I get back a false. Okay, and that may look weird, but just note that um, you will also find that in the second half of chapter six in the book, but I'm not gonna talk about that here in detail. Um, in order to model a, a character, you need to do that as a programmer, um, uh, you need to do that uh, by, some, by using some convention. And basically what you can think of is, um, just as we saw in the videos on the binary representation of integers, you have a, a certain sequence of zeros and ones that make up some integer number, some whole number. What you can then do is you can add another layer on top of that and you can basically by convention assign every number, every integer number, a letter, okay? And it turns out that the numbers going from zero to 127, so seven bit numbers, um, are usually used um, to model the so-called ASCII character set. Sometimes they also use eight bits. So um, it depends on how many special characters you want to add. And it turns out that all the uppercase letters are assigned to uh, numbers that are smaller than all the numbers of lowercase letters. And therefore, um, because the numbers that corresponds to the uppercase A or, or corresponds to the lowercase A here is um, bigger than the number that corresponds to the uppercase B. That is why um, apple is in this case not smaller than banana. And so one workaround here could of course be the following. If you have a situation like that, if you want to um, sort for alphabetical order here, you could simply go ahead and say, let's use the lower method on both sides. And this makes sure that we are only comparing uh, lowercase characters, of course. So if in a program you need to compare that and probably you will need that in uh, one of the exercises as well, um, then you simply do that the comparison by uh, lowercasing the words first. Okay, let's do one more example of comparison to get another rule down that is very similar, uh, very simple, and then uh, let's end the video. So um, let's um, go ahead and compare a couple of names. These are going to be German names um, because that uh, is the example I just uh, could make up, could make up easily. So let's compare the name for May, the month May, which is Mai in German. Let's compare that, for example, to the German last name, which is called Meyer. So both May and Meyer, the name, um, have the same starting sequence, the first three letters. So now the question is, which of the two is should come first? And the rule is the one that is shorter wins, okay? So if you go ahead, then um, my, uh, the month will simply be uh, smaller than Meyer. And you could extend that if you go ahead and we say, is that um, smaller than Meyer written with a Y? So there in German language, there are different ways of how to spell the, the last name Meyer. There's even another uh, version in the German language written with an EI like this. And of course also because the German language it's quite nice. There's of course also Meyer with um, EY here in it. And as we see, we can um, chain the different uh, operators together. This is called operate, an example of operator chaining, uh, something that we also saw in the previous video. And uh, this is a uh, comparison, a chain comparison that is simply true because all the names that come to the left are smaller than the names that come uh, to the right. Okay, so this is how um, string methods and, and operations work. And uh, in the next video, we will look briefly into so the topic of so-called string interpolation, and then we will end the, the discussion on strings. So I will see you in the next uh, video.